Hello, everyone. I want to welcome you to what will be a remarkable conversation with Bob Lenz, a longtime friend and professional colleague who I stand in great admiration for the fight he's led for his entire career to bring kids more authentic, more powerful learning experiences. I'm joined by Cap Capono Ciotti, my colleague at What School Could Be, and he will introduce you to Bob's really impressive resume, and then we'll dive right into a great discussion. Thanks for being here, everybody. It's really nice uh, to, to be together on YouTube Live as well as uh, Facebook Live, or if you're joining us asynchronously later. Uh, I get the uh, amazing opportunity to introduce a longtime friend and, like Ted said, somebody that we are just always in awe of and uh, appreciative to, uh, Bob Lenz. I'm going to do a short version of Bob's resume because it is... Uh, it is undoable in the, in the hour that we have right now. Bob became CEO of PBL Works on June 1st of 2015. Uh, before taking the helm at PBL Works, he was a co-founder of Envisions Education um, and served as its CEO and chief, innovation, uh, uh, chief of innovation until 2015. Uh, if you don't know in, uh, Envisions Education, that's where I first met Bob Lenz uh, and some amazing work that was done there. Under Bob's leadership, Envisions Education uh, put into practice a highly successful redesign model that's opened pathways uh, to college and uh, college and college retention for underserved urban students uh, in at Envision's three Bay Area arts and technology high schools. Um, Bob also launched Envision Partners. Envision Learning Partners fulfills uh, the original promise of charters to serve as demonstration sites for innovation education practices. He's recognized nationally um, as a leader in high school redesign, project-based learning, 21st century education, and performance. Uh, assessments. The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation recognized Bob as a senior deeper learning fellow, um, and he is uh, the author of Transforming Schools, Using Project-Based Learning, uh, Performance Assessment, and Common Core Standards. Um, welcome, Bob Lenz. It's a privilege uh, for us to have this conversation with you. Oh, thank you, Capono. Tad, you guys are, you humble me. Um, I'm just trying to do good work. No, I cut off. I cut off. Uh, you know, two thirds of what was there written about. So, um, that's just because I, I'm getting. That's just because I'm getting old. Uh, <laughs> you stick Martin around long old. enough, your resume gets a little longer. I've got you on that one, Bob. So, <laughs> hey, I'll launch off our conversation, Bob, if you don't mind, um, with just a simple question. Can you share with us the state of PBL today? That was that was how we shared you, this uh, game changer with our community. Um, tell us a little bit about the state of PBL today. Yeah, thanks, uh, Capono. Um, I, you know, the state of PBL, as they say, like, um, like we like to hear in the State of the Union, is the state of PBL is pretty darn strong, the strongest I've ever seen in my career. Um, we still got a long way to go, um, but the interest um, in project-based learning is more spread uh, deeper. Uh, not only in edu you know, in what you would typically think in education with um, educators, and and we do have a, a survey that we we did in 2020, um, uh, right before the pandemic, um, and I think it's actually accelerated since then. But you know, 76 to 80 percent of principals said project-based learning was a way to engage kids and teach them knowledge um, and con and content skills. So they saw that it was both. Uh, educator, uh, teachers, same same way. Um, we got um, uh, 76 to 80 percent of teachers believe project-based learning is good for kids. And probably most important, I think the biggest change and one of our goals when I first came in, in seven years ago was to get parents. And I think Ted, you know, I got uh, we got you to thank for a lot of that too, with with most likely to succeed and uh, what schools can be. And getting out and getting the word, but parents now, like 67, 70 percent of parents want authentic project based type experiences for their students on a regular basis. And I think after the pandemic and um, I mean, whatever, after in, but schools are kind of getting back to a little bit of normal and they realize like if they want to keep kids, especially in secondary and middle school engaged, they're going to have to do school differently. I mean, it's just the, the awareness is there. And project-based learning is uh, in the zone of proximate development for most educators and school leaders to think about moving as opposed to a complete redesign right off the bat. We think of it sort of as a Trojan horse. You go down this road, you start thinking about the conditions, 
you start seeing results for kids, then you're going to want to do more um, and, and redesign. And I, I would say the last piece of evidence that I could bear, like on the state of PBL, are, there's two. One is we have a growing evidence base. We can talk more about that um, uh, and what that's looking like. Uh, because for so often, I, you know, for the years that we've all been doing this work, we'd say, Project Research, we know it's so great for kids and come see this exhibition and hear the kids talk and watch this video. And then, you know, we'd say like the, well, the, the cranky, you know, data person would come out and say, but what's the evidence? But we have, we have some really strong evidence now that it actually meets the promise that we thought. And then also we have states like the state of Kentucky where we're in partnership with which has a goal right now to have at least a third of the schools be doing project-based learning uh, by 2025. Um, and so, you know, I think we'll do more than that. Um, but this is, uh, this just gives you a sense of like, this isn't just a school enterprise anymore. It's not just a district, it's actually states. And even the Secretary of Education is calling out project-based learning as a, an important strategy. I mean, if you would have told me that 20 years ago, I'd, I'd be shaking, you know, I would tell you you're crazy. <laughs> Which I'm sure many people have. Uh, I've been on the receive side of that as well. Maybe bring to life a little bit some of the evidence because it's quite powerful what you're learning and able to communicate to people. Yeah, there's, um, we were uh, fortunate to be part of a uh, partnership with Lucas Education Research, which is part of the George Lucas Education Foundation. We, we were one of of several RCT, random control studies for PBL. So ours was a project where we did the professional development and used a curriculum called Knowledge in Action that was developed by the University of Washington for environmental science and government for advanced placement. And when I was at Envision uh, Education, our teachers and our team actually worked with the University of Washington to develop these projects. Um, over the course of the study, we found that on the student side, eight, in the first year, there was an 8% better passage rate uh, for credit on the AP uh, than the control group. And the second year, it was 10%. For the teachers, they reported that the instructional strategies they were now utilizing in other courses um, and persisting in that use, which you know often doesn't happen in professional development. So the results, you know, you know, I'm like eight or 10 percent. That sounds pretty good. Well, the college board was they've never seen results like that. So we now have a partnership with the college board and we're doing training. We trained about 500 AP teachers this summer, about 750 last summer. We're working with them to consult to actually redesign more AP course curriculum into a project based approach because they're, they see this as is the future. There was also great data for first and second grade uh, social studies and literacy uh, with uh, Nell Duke's uh, work in, in Michigan and Joe Krashek in third through fifth grade science and literacy. And the students there did uh, better on the Michigan State science test than the students who had the traditional approach. Um, and all of the studies, the kids were far more engaged, report interest in learning more, the students in the AP classes want to study that in college. The kids who were in the control group were like, I never want to see that again. So th it's, uh, it's really growing. Um, and and all of these qualify for the what, what Works Clearinghouse. So they're SA strong evidence now. And, I, and on, on oh, yeah, engagement, but... an engagement, did they actually quantify, you know, attitudinal outlooks of students toward their learning? Because I think that's what we all believe understand so well is an engaged student will learn and a bored student doesn't. And I think that's one of the real contributions you make. Yes. Uh, yeah. In the studies, they were followed up with focus groups and surveys about the student's engagement and interest in further study of the, of the academic subjects. Um, and you can actually watch the videos of the kids doing the work and you actually see the engagement. So this is where like the heart and the head are coming together. <laughs> I, um, I, 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 a, couple, a comment, uh, I worked uh, when I first started teaching in high school, uh, a, a teacher I'd shared a room with was teaching AP economics. 
and I'm, I'm sure both of you kind of guess my feelings about uh, AP economics as a benchmark or doing better in AP economics uh, being something gigantic to celebrate. You, you probably can guess my feelings on that. But, you know, it's, uh, who was it? Somebody in the chat had said um, that uh, oh, Susanna had said partner, partnering with the College Board matters so much just because that's, that is a, a metric that so many people care about, right? And uh, this was probably 20 plus years ago. And the teacher I partnered in his room uh, was using um, simple, but at that point, you know, pr pretty advanced for, for where we were at, uh, project-based learning techniques and strategies um, to, to do uh, the AP econ curriculum. And he had the highest uh, AP scores in the state um, and was snatched up by uh, another school that was much more AP focused than the school I was at. Uh, it, is, it is a really neat, um, it's a neat data point for their uh, interestingly, I just found out uh, with a, a friend of mine who's a uh, leading college board in Canada, uh, Terry Godwalt, the college board in Canada just uh, announced uh, entrance to college by portfolio that the, uh, their college board Canada has now negotiated with the top universities in Canada, which is going to be really interesting. Wow, that's amazing. Um, they're going to need to have some good projects to put in this portfolios <laughs> they certainly will they certainly I mean one will. of the things we found when we were at Envision we did um we did a, a impact study with uh, Stanford uh with Linda Darling Hammond um and we we did uh fall uh they did case studies of our schools and got inside the schools to see what the practices were and then they did focus groups and follow up uh with our graduates and um you know, we found that 85, we had a, like an 85% persistence rate through the first year of college. And the majority of our kids are black and brown, low income. Um, and so that's just like, you know, and we had probably close to 95, 99% of those kids who graduated went to college. But when they did the follow-up to say, like, and they asked the question, like, what, what do you think that Envision did that best prepared you to have success in your first year of college? And so um, uh, for the College Board in Canada, the portfolio and defense were in the top three, um, project-based learning, um, and the teachers. And that's what the kids said, like, it, those three things, the experiences and the practices and the teachers who cared about them are what got them ready to go, not just to get into college, but to, to thrive in college. So I just have I have a, a something I kind of wanted to push into, uh, and it kind of goes along with uh, Mark Lang's question. Mark had asked, uh, "Where are the numbers coming from? Uh, where he is?" He said, "Hardly any schools are doing PBL. What what's the, what's the challenge still? I mean, it seems like, from my experience, that this is almost a no-brainer, right? We know we know now from the evidence that you're sharing that on traditional old metrics, this is helping." And we know that the kind of metrics that I care about, uh, specifically engagement and getting kids ready for the world that they're going to inherit, that this is, you know, from the, its inception has been where to go. What's what's holding people up still? Oh, <laughs> I don't think we got enough time. But, um, you know, it's interesting uh, for Mark. Like, I think there's um, there's pockets of uh, the, the pockets are getting much larger of interest in practice and project-based learning, like parts of the country. So Hawaii, where we first met uh, Capono, I mean, is one of the leaders in, you know, in, in the country as far as penetration of project-based learning going across the state. We have like places like Kentucky, which is, has an has a effort. Uh, we've done tons of work in places like, in states like Virginia, Texas, California, some of the bigger states. And then there's some states that we hardly work in at all and we're trying to figure out what is that reason. There's some of the reason why folks don't decide to move this way is because of fear. Um, and now we're finding that's unfounded probably of having their test scores go down. So the evidence that we have now lets you know that actually your test scores might uh, go up. Um, interestingly, uh, parents are uh, might be afraid of of them not being able to get into college, project-based learning actually isn't changing the system. It's actually giving the students an opportunity to apply and demonstrate what they know 
and reflect on it and build the metacognition that they can then transfer into college. And it's actually a great for their applications for either the essays or if they do accept a portfolio or work to, to, to differentiate yourself from the other students to show like, I actually have done stuff that's actually authentic and real. I'm ready to do college level work. Um, the, uh, so the other reason is, is often, you know, money. Um, you know, you, you're gonna have to build capacity for people to do this. So is there, are there resources? We know there's resources. It's a matter of how you're uh, deciding to value your resources and your budget and apply it. Um, and, then, and then time and the structure, the lack of coherence that's going on in schools usually is a, uh, becomes a barrier. Um, but uh, it's, uh, uh, even with all those barriers, there's folks who are having, you know, are persisting sometimes on their own. There's like little islands of innovation. And I know, Ted, you find them and highlight them. And then there's other places that are like, you know, we're seeing like, you know, whole districts and systems. We work with about 15 districts, as, some as large as like Clark County Schools in Nevada or Broward County Schools in Florida. Um, so like every middle school in Broward County, uh, Florida, uses project-based learning, every single one. Yeah, I, there are a couple of things on the, the paranoia and risk aversion around college admissions I, I always focus on. One is that the perception that if you do more project-based work in high school it will hurt your college chances. I think it actually helps, right? The kids are more engaged. They do just as well or better on the standard metrics. And then oftentimes it turns into a great essay. But I have spent, I would actually say quite unproductively, but a lot of time with college admissions officers, really encouraging them to, to put forth an alternative path to application. You know, like you can apply based on your standard transcript or you can apply with your, you know, your leading foot being your portfolio and I said to them, you're already doing this, right? You, you're already doing this and you're doing it well. And that's called athletes. You know, you know they, they, don't, they don't accept athletes based on their SAT scores and grade point average. They look at a portfolio of their accomplishments and something they're passionate about. And then the rest is there as sort of a check. So I think that it's a lot easier for admissions to do than, than I think they fear it is. I don't know. But um, I think the more pressure we collectively can put on them, because I think if a number of top colleges just said, we're going to put a lot of value on the portfolio of work you can communicate to us that you've been able to accomplish. You know, boy, that would be a major signal to high schools that this is exactly the way to go. Yes, I agree. And when they, the two things that are going on that I think play like play for project-based learning, but also for kids is um, the movement to have a portrait of a learner, a portrait of a graduate, a graduate profile, you know, we've done some analysis and we of that. And I would say like 80, 90 percent of the dispositions and skills are the same across every community in the in the country. So we're actually more in sync. You know, we talk about how we're divided a lot. We see in the politics and things. But it, as far as what we want for our, our young people, we're pretty much in sync. Parents, business people, community members, um, the other is there is a movement um, where I'm a member of, a, of an advisory group called, called Reimagining College Admissions uh, that the Learning Policy Institute has been uh, leading. They've been working closely with NACAC, the National Association for College Admissions. And there are a set of colleges that are actually willing and some able to use portfolios for admissions. Uh, University of Michigan School of Business for undergraduate admissions, you must submit a portfolio. Um, MIT accepts portfolios, so it's it's we're on the cusp, and I yeah, agree. We're close. It's another, you... another Trojan horse. Like that, we, let's get kids in by portfolio, and then schools that want to get kids into college, like to the the parent that was worried about their the system changing. Well, actually, maybe if they you. You might be ahead of the game if you've changed. You 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 got a portfolio of projects you can share. Yeah, no question. You know, and and schools of art and design, right? You know, RISD, Pratt, uh, SCAD, they are very portfolio driven, and they get great students that might not yeah. ordinarily rise to the top, but they kind of know what they're doing, right? We want kids that can do great art, can do great architecture, can do great design, 
So hmm, why don't we look for evidence of that in the application? Seems, yeah. seems like a mm -hmm. no-brainer. Hey, um, we have a question from uh, somebody here that asking uh, if we, you could give us some examples, Bob, of the type of work that PBL, uh, PBL Works is doing right now. Uh, maybe some stories or uh, allegories or uh, uh, anecdotes of, uh, of what, what you guys are up to right now. Sure. Um, so we, um, we, have, we think of this as a, a holistic system. Um, and, and thinking about our work. So if you put students in the center and think about the students uh, and their outcomes. So, and we think of it as simultaneous outcomes. So the academic content and skills that they need, success skills like critical thinking, problem solving, um, communication skills, working in a team, the things that we see in those graduate profiles. Um, and then um, the sense of agency that you can tackle problems in your community, in your life, and you can transfer that. So we believe project-based learning is a strategy that simultaneously allows you to get all three of those outcomes. Um, the teachers need their capacity built in order to create those experiences for kids. So that's, that's a big part, the main part of our work. We probably work with close to 30,000 teachers in a year doing a 101 workshop, which is a three day to get you started. We have sustained support visits to come to your school and help you and your team or your whole faculty. Um, we also have consultancy, now online consultancy hours. We have asynchronous modules so that, you know, how often do you go to workshop and then you're like, what was that thing that they told us on how to put kids in groups? You can go back and check that out. So lots of teacher services. And over the last five years, one of the things we've built out quite robustly is school leadership services. And we either do that within the context of a school district, or we also do that in regional networks. And we have one in our fourth cohort starting in Hawaii next week. That's how we're running our work in Kentucky. We have, we have probably, I think, six or seven launching this year. We have one in Massachusetts. We're, talking in, we're launching one in January, in, uh, or maybe two in New York, one in Texas. And those are where school leaders are coming together to think about the conditions that need to be put in place being clear about why they're doing PBL. Uh, and when we talk about conditions, it's both the culture and the infrastructure. Like what's how a traditional schedule, whether it's elementary, middle or high school might not build enough time in for project-based learning to happen. You're gonna have to think about that. What's your professional learning plan? And then what evidence are you gonna use? And then the last layer is what we call coherence and working with school districts or states to build a coherent system so that there's alignment with what the outcomes and the assessment for kids, what's expected of teachers and what's expected of, of, um, of the principals and their teams. So that's a lot of, that's some of our work. And if we have time, I, I, there's a few schools I can shout out that have, are doing pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. Give us some, uh, give us some uh, concrete stuff there. What, what's happening. So, um, there's a, a wonderful elementary school in Greeley, Colorado. Um, and I don't know when I, and it's kind of North in the, in the, um, what they call the, the front range um, area. And I don't know when I think of Colorado in the front range, I don't think of it being a, a, a big Latinx community. Um, but this school was like over 90% Latinx uh, students. And when the principal came in, uh, they were on the watch list for like, did they need to be reconstituted or shut down? She started sending her first cohort when she came in, they decided project-based learning and understanding by design and literacy were going to be the three strategies that were going to turn around the school. So uh, they sent a team to PBO World, our signature event that we hold annually in the summer, currently in, in um, America Canyon up in Napa County, um, California. And over the years, they just kept sending more and more teachers. It became like this rite of passage, if you will. Into three years, they were not on the bottom of the list. They weren't in the middle of the list. Now they're on the innovative, like you get some more freedom because the results were so powerful for kids. And if you talk to the teachers and the kids there, they'll say it was because of project-based learning. And then uh, last, was it last week? Yeah, last week I was in New York City and, and, uh, meeting with our good friends at Thomas Edison Career and Technical Education School in Brooklyn. 
And they've been working with us for a few years. And similarly, they were like, you know, CTE should be project-based, but they were doing projects, but not project-based learning. And so they started doing training and they're just getting amazing results um, there and, and become sort of a lighthouse. They were our PBL champions this year. And then I'll, and then I can't go without shouting out our, our friends in um, Hawaii at the Sikh school and the Malama Hanua school in Waimanalo um, are just um, using, you know, integrating those, the, 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 uh, the, the place of Hawaii and with project-based learning in a remarkable ways and sort of showing how place and PBL work really together to, to get great results for kids. I, I want to, you mentioned one that's near and dear to my heart, but the CTE school, Thomas Edison, you know, if I could snap my fingers and change anything about American education, I'd have all kids in a CTE environment but yeah. particularly coupled with what you're doing. So are there other opportunities? I mean, are people beginning to get that? Because, you know, I think that's a far better way to learn how the world actually works, to actually get out there and have to make something function and then use that as a portal to the theory. Instead, we, we tend to teach all academic theory and then people leave and they have no idea. I, I use in my yeah. talks this, it's a great MIT clip. It's like two minutes long, but on graduation day, they ask MIT graduates, um, could you light up this wire, you know, light bulb with a wire and a battery? And they're all insulted, you know, like, cause they were like five on AP physics, five on AP Cal right, right. 800 SATs and MIT engineering courses graduating. They can't do it. Right. They can't do it. <laughs> and, and you realize that, that all kids, if every kid in high school actually were doing more hands-on in that case, you know, electrical, you know, basically what a master electrician does They'd be better MIT students, but some would also get excited about being an electrician. And I, I love that connection. I'd love to see that. Yeah. Amplified. No, I think, you know, we're excited. We're going to partner with them. They're, they're sort of becoming a hub and a lighthouse in New York City, um, rightfully so. Uh, we do some good partnership work with the uh, Linked Learning Alliance here in California, Connect Ed, the Center for College and Career, sort of thinking about the pathways and Project-based learning is a key part of linked learning, uh, whether you're in a career academy or a pathway. Um, and, and, and one of the reasons we're starting to work with them because there's the, the, the challenge is, Ted, like it, it goes to Capona, like why, what's, what, what's a barrier? Well, people in CTE believe they're doing projects already. And they are, but they're not doing project-based learning. So they're either the academics are completely separate and they're not integrating so that the kids can see how you actually use the content in the career area, or they're just sort of following more of a recipe to build something. So they might know how to put the battery and the, and the light together, but they don't know why that works so that when they get a new and different situation that applies the same principles, they can apply it. So that's where we like, that's for me, the biggest difference in thinking about project-based learning is it, it, versus a project. At the end, the students be able to tell you why yeah. they did what they did and how it relates to their future, the world outside of school. And that I, I totally agree with you. The promise for CTE in that area is just huge. Kids are looking for alternatives and four-year colleges. Let's get them, let's get them certificates and, and and authentic portfolios to go show their work to employers and get kids you know out in the real world then then they might want to go back and get a, an advanced degree you know even a bs or a ba but right now i don't know that it makes a lot of economic sense to a lot of kids um because they don't see the they don't see it as colleges anywhere relevant uh to their lives um and it's very expensive it's a huge issue and an enormous opportunity. I, I hope Cardona, who's got a CTE background, uh, begins to exhibit some real leadership there because, you know, we, we do tend to say it's like the last chance for some kids and it really ought to be front and center for all kids done right. And, and I think you're unlocking a lot of that potential. Yeah. That's a, it's an interesting kind of like we've set this up as a uh, one of two paths, right? You, you're, you're, uh, naturally good or you put in the work or you have the right social economic background that you're going to do really well on an uber academic path or right or you do a CTE path and it sounds like you're, you're getting a bunch of evidence that uh, 
potentially it's not an either or with this with uh, with project based learning at the core of this it doesn't have to be uh, and and it kind of making me think if if the either or um, is I don't know that I, I wouldn't say it's set up by our pedagogy or instructional strategies but it certainly is calcified by our instructional strategies and pedagogies that we have different instructional strategies pedagogies based on these two different potential outcomes. And that might not need to happen that we can bring those paths closer together. Yeah, I, I, I think that is the promise is bringing together, and the, you know, you know, there are some good examples also on, uh, uh, on Hawaii um, with uh, Waipahu uh, High School. Uh, we did a lot of work out there with the complex area and the principal there, um, uh, Keith is now the, the yeah. state superintendent, and he was really excited about that because I think Keith and his team really saw it for many years ago, saw this connection of, of where you tie academics and the career. It's, not, it's a both and an and. Um, and I think that's where you'll, you'll see. It, it, one of our, our keynotes at uh, PBL World a few years ago uh, was a young woman named Yvonne. Um, she went to the Envision schools. She was a, she was a stellar student. She, her family immigrated from Mexico and she ended up doing a dual major at Cal um, in journalism and, and um, some, I can't even remember what the other study was, but it was well, well beyond my, you know, my pay grade. Um, and she's just amazing. But in her keynote, she tells a story about her brother that went to the Envision school who she was like worried that he wasn't even gonna graduate from high school. And um, through his workplace learning experience, he got really excited about design. So he not only graduated from high school, he went right on to San Francisco State to study design. And now he's a college graduate um, and doing work in the design field. And it was actually the career and technical aspect, that workplace experience, that actually inspired him to want to go study further. Because now we saw why he would want to go to school instead of this esoteric um, college experience, which for many like me, that was fine. I, I just wanted to go to college and get out of the house. Um, and, and then I'd figure out, you know, but then I graduated from college. I didn't know what I was going to do. <laughs> I had no clue. Yeah, and, and and probably no hundred and fifty thousand dollars of debt back then, right? No, it, it was I had debt, but not not like that. Yeah. Hey, um, so we got all of these really good stories. You've, you've referred to a uh, um some amazing data. Uh, friend of what school could be, and I think friend of all four of ours, uh, Susie Boss, uh, is following our conversation, and she's tweeting on Twitter. She asked uh, this question: How are you seeing districts gather evidence of growth uh, with uh, some of the outcomes that you've you've talked about, critical thinking, well, maybe not explicitly, but of implied critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, um, because she says some school boards demand that metrics. Maybe we have principals and superintendents uh, and school leaders to teachers who want to go in this direction. But how do I get access, I think is Susie's question, to these metrics as far as I mean, maybe I, I blow up Susie's question a little bit more and say, where do we get access to all of this, the success in CTE, the success in APs and, and college entrance, and specifically the success in these portrait of a graduate traits that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, have a, I have an answer and then I wanted to put a link. Is there a way for me to put a link in the chat or... Maybe I'll put it in the private yeah. chat and somebody JT, can... JT will share the link if you if you if you share yeah. it there. That'll be great. there. We go. So we have a we developed an evidence framework uh, to help districts think about this exact issue. Uh, one of our deep partners was the Hawaii Department of Education. We also work with three other districts uh, across the country, um, so that uh, we can start measuring that. But we actually asked them to start with like. Because if you're going to start your PBL journey or any change journey, you're, you're not going to start like in 2022, 23, and then immediately see like dramatic, like change happen in student outcomes. I mean, let's just be honest. You're going to see some and you can highlight and, and focus on that. But we also want people checking and making sure they're collecting the, the inputs and they're on track that are actually doing high quality project-based learning, that they're giving the teachers the time to do the, the planning 
And um, because often we say we're going to do this intervention, we don't do it well, we get bad results, and then we blame the intervention not on not not on the on the quality of the implementation. So we're asking folks to do that. On the other side, which one of the things that we um, uh, that led us, I, I, don't, I don't think we've talked about this, the work we did with Lucas Education Research and Knowledge in Action, some other studies that evidence that we've gathered, led us to the conclusion that teachers need a high quality project-based learning curriculum. Um, and so we're designing um, uh, K through 12 science units aligned to national, uh, the next generation science standards. We just got funding a few months ago from uh, the Bezos Family Foundation to create fourth through 12th grade, and eventually we'll get K through three. Social studies, PBL units, we're talking to some folks about math and ELA. We're also talking in building out some career themed projects. All of those projects are gonna have validated performance assessment frameworks and rubrics that will be standard. So for example, for the districts who wanna see whether they're making a difference Let's just say everybody in the fifth grade in your school or your district does this project. They actually have a common assessment that they can do that can be scored using the rubric. And you can start to actually see, you know, you do the project the next semester, you do a different one with the same assessment, but a different theme, a different pro, like maybe a different authentic product. You can start to actually gather student learning data in addition to the others. Now we, we're also gonna do a research project on the math. We're, we're making hatching plans right now to do some field test, build it and field test it in Massachusetts. And the projects that we're gonna do there, we're actually gonna identify the problems that the students will see on the, on the state math test, like the subset. So maybe there's five questions on the 100 that they get We'll actually, we're going to see whether we, we, the students do better in their recall and application and transfer to those five questions. Not the whole test, because we're not doing a whole curriculum. We're only doing supplementary units or substitution units. So I do, I do think the future is in gathering more data, and especially data that schools and districts can gather themselves without having to wait till the end of, an end of year test or and a third party come in and tell you whether you're doing it. It's really powerful teachers to assess the work together. So, so I want to switch gears from, um, we talked earlier about the impact of project-based learning on student engagement and motivation. I'd like to switch that to educator motivation and engagement. So could you just share maybe anecdotally how teachers in the field respond when they're able to challenge kids with more authentic learning experiences. And I'm very interested in what you're seeing in terms of colleges of education offering courses to aspiring teachers about how you teach, run a, a project-based learning environment. Because honestly, if you're in a school of education and it's reading from a textbook and administering bubble tests, I don't think we're going to get that many young adults excited about educating, you know, the next generation. But I think if they knew what was there, the opportunities that you offer, that might change a lot of attitudes about the teaching profession. Um, so you want the good news or the bad news first? <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I, I have a feeling I can predict. <laughs> Let's start with the bad news in the schools of education. Yeah. Um, it's unreal. We had a we had a great opportunity. We we're we worked with a, a California foundation called ECNC. They were interested in in project based learning approach in colleges of education. Um, we it was you know it's not often that I can I say this about projects that I've been part of. This one was an abject failure. I'll just tell you, like just just from the beginning we couldn't get colleges of education to sign up to be part of it. And we did, we, we devised a strategy where we would partner local school districts that where the teachers, where the student teachers would do their student teaching. There was a, our, our premise was like, if you don't start with PBL out of the gate, you're gonna get sucked into this, to the mainstream system. And it's now we gotta do all, we gotta help you re, 
unlearn what you learn and start learning a new way. We couldn't get anybody to do it. We eventually we got four very small regional colleges to participate. And at the end of the day, there was only one. Um, Mary's College in Dakota and North Dakota, Bismarck, yeah. and uh, North Dakota State, they combined. We worked in Bismarck schools, and that was an amazing like experience. And they had really strong leadership. Um, the colleges of education, I mean, we think it's hard to change K through 12 schools. Like deans and presidents, they have no they can only suggest, right? And and maybe offers incentives, but there's it, uh, it's very difficult to change it. And then I did to, I've done some some teaching and in, in, uh, adjunct teaching on a few courses. And the other thing is the state compliance. This is where the coherence comes in. The state compliance on credentialing um, either teachers or administrators. I was working with school leaders. It's so cumbersome. Like there's you really have to be. You know, I did still did it in a project based approach and with portfolios and performance assessments. But it was like it was it was a lot of work to rethink that. So I we, we uh, I've been on the buck. I was on the buck board for nine years, the Buck Institute for Education um, from 2001 to 2010. And then I, you know, I've been here now for seven years um, and there was a big break in between. But every time we did strategic planning, this question would come up, Ted, and we we're like, we should work with colleges of education because that's where all the teachers are. And then now I'd say, and we, we would never do it. And then I got this grant opportunity. So we did it. If we're going to go into strategic planning again, we are not going to work with teachers colleges. We're just not, it's just, it's a waste of money and a waste of time right now, which is really sad on the good news side. Teachers are stoked to do project-based learning. Oh, yeah. I, I, I have a whole talk. It's like, you know, it's like project-based learning is as good for teachers as it is for kids. Like I, you know, it, it began, and, and I think that's really important that teachers, like it's not easy changing your practice, especially for veteran teachers. It's a different paradigm and thinking about where are you putting the control of learning to the student as opposed to the teacher who's been doing that. Um, and so we really want to make sure that teachers understand, like, this is actually why you got into teaching and give it a shot. And that's what we hear back. I mean, in our surveys, like, you know, I, uh, I, don't, and I don't know if folks know about net promoter scores. So we ask every teacher at the end of a workshop, you know, or a leader, how likely are you to recommend this um, uh, uh, workshop to a colleague? And we get like, our ratings are usually 60 or 70% um, mm -hmm. net promoter score. So like 50 is really good, like top of class. As you know, 60 or 70, that's like uh, blowing it out of the water. And that's steady what we get. And teachers write, literally write, I now remember why I got into teaching. This is why I got into teaching, to make a real difference for kids. And, you know, we all talk about the proverbial light bulb going off. Well, it ain't going to happen when you're doing a worksheet or answering the questions at the end of the book. It is not. But you work on a project that you care about. And even if the project doesn't work the way you envision it, the kids still learn. And, and they have such different ways to exhibit their talents and interests. I mean, that's just it. It's not this bell curve with a few kids as gifted and everybody else viewed as an also ran. So I think we need to, to find the most massive two by four and deliver it up against the head of some of these higher ed institutions. <laughs> Well, so on that, I'm going to do a shameless plug, and you're here to uh, hear it first, everybody, on this uh, Game Changer, is uh, we will be partnering with um, the University of, uh, with Spalding University in Kentucky and uh, Two Revolutions to offer uh, a master's uh, program, uh, teaching and learning masters and uh, leader, leading deeper learning masters. It's not teacher prep yet, uh, but certainly that's been on the radar, right, at what school could be. Uh, it was interesting. Janelle Field uh, was the one who said, thank you, Ted, for this question. Uh, Janelle and I actually had a long conversation recently about this and uh, people who are in charge of onboarding new teachers, um, how, how difficult it can be to undo the learning that somebody just came out of a, a, a college of education with um, and 
because there's so many things that are up in the air when you're first learning to teach, right? Those first two years are so hard that it's essential to come in ready to go with these types of instructional strategies and pedagogies because you're trying to learn all these other things. And <laughs> yeah. uh, if you don't, the question that Janelle and I were, were, were lamenting about together is uh, what am I supposed to teach? Uh, emphasis on supposed to. And the implied answer being, you know, hey, department chair, what page should I be on? Uh, and how uninspiring that is for kids. Yeah, or here's the text. Yeah, here's your textbook or your workbook. Um, it's one of the reasons why we are developing the curriculum units. And we and we have actually right now on our website, we have 72 projects that are outlined and lots of resources. So teachers have a stronger place to start. And we sort of call that the adapt strategy. So you're adapting a project. And even the curriculum that we develop will be um, adaptable. Uh, because it needs to be culturally responsive. It's for sure going to be anti-racist uh, themes that will relate to social and environmental justice as well as the kids' lives. But the teachers, especially newer teachers, spending all that time learning how to design a project or align your assessments, that's a lot to ask for anyone, let alone a new teacher. So this way we feel like it, it allows teachers to focus on learning the instructional strategies. And getting good at that. And then some might decide to be a designer someday. Um, and that's awesome too. But it's a lot to learn. And we just feel like teachers, especially newer teachers, need you know more, more concrete resources that can get them get them going quicker um, and, and having success quicker. So that there's they're like, oh, I don't have to like muddle through my first couple projects before I actually start seeing results. We want to see those results like right off the bat. I want to follow up with this and then I'll throw it to Ted. Um, so I, I, I think that we were working at, on something together a long time ago, Bob, and I think it was from you that you were talking about, I think at that point, like renovation before innovation, um, that we need to be renovating some of these uh, projects before we start innovating in them so we can take those small steps and actually start using them. Uh, you know, speaking of those projects that actually make a difference, uh, somebody in one of the chats had asked, um, if you could share a little bit about projects that challenge the norm, for example, projects that result in a march for women's rights to choose or a march against gun ownership. Uh, there's definitely a political slant to that question. But if I were to, to pull it out a little bit, um, I guess the question is really about uh, if you've seen some really good projects that get students to be uh, agents of their own of their own worlds that they live in. Uh, yeah, I've seen it, um, multiple times. Um, we, we, we were going to run out of time. I got so many stories on that one. But I, I'll actually tell you a project that I did with, with kids when I was teaching. Um, we were studying government. And we came up with a project that we said, well, government, in order to really understand how legislation happens, you, let's, you, we want you to pick a governmental body that you want to bring um, a solution to a problem in our Bay Area community didn't even have to be in the, there. So the kids chose uh, state um, because they wanted to go to Sacramento. I think that was the biggest reason. We told them if they did, you know, they'd have to figure that out. So we ended up taking a train up to Sacramento. Um, but it was interesting what the students decided to focus on. And it was a whole process, uh, just like if you were doing it in a school to figure out what your focus of your with teachers and that dissonance of where you're trying to like, what's our reform going to be? So the kids eventually decided school facilities. They took a trip. We were in Marin County across the bay to Oakland and Richmond, and they visited uh, high schools there. And they were just appalled at the state of the facilities. They thought theirs were bad. And this was in the 1990s. And so uh, uh, the Prop um, 13 that passed here had cut off school funding for facilities. You had to get like six, a super majority to get a school bond. And so nobody was getting school bonds because they could no, couldn't get that many people to vote for it. So the students came up with this idea that eventually became a proposition was to lower, don't go all the way down to 50, but go up to 55%. And um, it became Prop 39. But they brought the idea, met with, uh, set up meetings and met with legislators and, and folks and lobbied uh, the, the politicians to think differently about school facilities. And I'll never forget, like the next year, Prop 39 came on the ballot and students were emailing me. You know, I don't 
other people were thinking about this, but they were like, sure that they had influenced this uh, legislation to get uh, get going. And we've done, I've seen like our schools in Envision have tackled many of the same issues, like when they're looking in their local community, environmental justice issues in Bayview, Hunters Point in San Francisco with the asthma rates are so much higher and the students created public service announcements and, and petitioned that. Uh, gun violence and so many of their friends and friends of friends were, you know, Related to that, they organized a big walk across the Golden Gate Bridge um, uh, with T-shirts and got on the news. So you you ask the question, you give kids an opportunity. You don't even have to tell them like, oh, this is going to be about gun violence. They're going to tell you what the issues are. And don't try to tell them because they're living in it uh, right there. And it's just and that's where you get that agency. I mean, you those kids know that whatever ta problems they're going to tackle in their own lives, they have an experience of tackling even bigger ones in their community while they're in high school. It's the most powerful aspect. And by the way, they learned about government. They know the three branches of government and they know how a bill becomes a law. <laughs> and, and they'll remember this 20 years from now. I mean, th these are the experiences yeah. that change lives. Did you, I'm curious, one that, that I'd love to hear some examples of, but it may not have happened is as we, went into COVID and we had all this disruption, did any of your schools empower students to propose solutions for how they could keep learning during the disruption? Or, or did they all have parents shouting at each other in school board meetings, you know, often advancing the most ignorant points of view? Uh, well, it was interesting. I, I was talking with a teacher from Thomas and Essen last week and he was telling about how they actually brought the kids in to help them design the projects that they were going to do during COVID. Nice. And, um, and it made all the difference in the world. Um, but they doubled down on project-based learning during the, the pandemic because they felt like that was the only way they were going to keep kids engaged. So here, I mean, you, we, people, most people have heard about like the exodus of kids, especially in secondary over the course of the pandemic, Thomas Edison, uh, 21 and 21 had a, um, a 93% graduation rate. And, and in, nine, in 2022, like probably the most challenging school year of all time, a 92% graduation rate. And I'm going to tell you, and we, and we also had other districts. I don't know how they, how much they got kids involved, but this was like elementary uh, district where they decide, they let the schools decide who was going to work with us. So about half the schools did project-based learning training and half didn't. And when March 2020 happened and they had to like rethink things right away, it was night and day because the kids who were doing projects were already had a habit of being self-directed. So they could give them more complex assignments. They could trust that they were going to do that while they were off camera and, and, and coming back. Whereas the teachers who were in the traditional were just like, and here's another, have your parents come by and pick up the workbook. Um, and then like, why aren't the kids doing the work? <laughs> they I mean, it didn't make sense before. It really doesn't make sense no. now. So no. we just saw a profound difference in schools that already had a habit and a practice of PBL. It was difficult if, if, if you see, if, to do it then. Have you seen any major stories and papers write about that? I mean, one of the things that bothers me is that the, the level of education expertise of our reporters, and I hate to dump on reporters because they play a really important role, but but one that's really been bugging me is, is the headlines around the NAEP score decreases. And, and you know, you look at it and they, they, they drop two to three percent during the two most disrupted years in the history of U.S. education, yet the headlines all read plummet devastating declines, everything else. Yeah. And you realize that even our education reporters, probably all of whom went to Northwestern or something, have no numerical, they, they're not numerically literate, right? The, the, no. the headline should say, despite kids being in and out of school for two years, there was a, a kind of a modest decline. But I think that's a kind of story, that, that contrast of A versus B. One district, kids with project-based learning experience sailed through unbelievably challenging times Versus kids in normal, if it was boring in person, guess what? It got no better on Zoom. Those are the things that the, the nation needs to be focused on. Yeah, I know, Dad. It's interesting. I think um, 
you know, we had that that data from uh, the Lucas Education Research, not just ours, but like all these projects. It was, you know, amazing work, amazing results. It was very difficult to get any story, you know, national stories about that. And you can imagine L the Lucas Foundation got the best to yeah. like promote it. And I, there's just so much noise in the system right now. And that it's very difficult to rise above the polarization, which, like I mentioned before, I think this is actually a place where we're all in pretty, you know, much agreement about what we think kids should should be getting, um, regardless of how you view the world politically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, uh, we we we. Well, thanks to you guys, where there's more stories going out and more conversation about this stuff than was happening before. So thank you for all the work you, you Ted, you and Capono, you're doing to raise the voices and the stories of so many inspirational educators around the, the country. I mean, it, it inspires me to keep doing the work we do. Well, well, right back at you. But it, I mean, it just, you know, I, I, it's hard to overstate that that the difference when you challenge kids with authentic learning is not a 1.3% up or a 2% down no. test score. I mean, this is life changing for so many kids. And, and you know, you just realize that the, the opportunities, the upside isn't this, you know, it's like, you know, like from here to Mars. And, and yet, you know, it's like, you'll see these things where everybody, you know, I, I just, I read these stories. I just say like, what are they thinking? You know, like, I mean, yeah. you know, the answer is they're not, or, a headline that says test scores plummet gets people to click on it. And, you know, we live in an algorithm world where something that has some nuance and requires you to actually think a little bit about it, you know, it seems like, oh my gosh, we can't spend the time on it. But I, I, I'll speak for, I mean, myself, but I think I speak for so many other people to express my gratitude for all the work you've done. I mean, it's not, it's been over a career, a body of work that's really made a huge difference to so many kids, so many educators. And, and I think we've all benefited from Bob Lenz and, and the, the huge footprints you're leaving on this planet. Oh, thank you. You know, I just got to say like, I'm really good at having great conversations like this with you all. And, uh, but I got an amazing team back at PBL works. And I also had an amazing, and we still have an amazing team and a vision and so I always say, like, you know, I, I'm pretty good at coming up with some ideas. Some of them are good. Some of them are really crappy. But I get ideas. But what really you need is the people that can actually execute them and execute them really well and make, you know, make a difference for the teachers and the leaders that we work with. And um, that's what, I'm just fortunate. I have a, an amazing team of, of colleagues that actually every day are either designing those things or out actually doing the work in the field, inspire, you know, those educators that say, now I remember why I got into teaching. That's because they had an amazing national faculty member from PBL Works who inspired them that they could actually make a difference in kids. So mm -hmm. I appreciate, you know, uh, I'm humbled by the, by the, your kind words, but I just want you to know, like, I'm, I'm not anyone if it wasn't for all the people that are actually doing the real work um, and taking, you know, a a actually executing on the vision um, every day. And I'm, I'm really, really fortunate to, to get to work with them. And, and then, you know, it's actually the educators in the schools, the, the teachers, the leaders um, that are creating these experiences for kids, because we can do all the PD and all the resources. But if, you know, the leaders and the, the teachers don't do the work, then it doesn't change. So, uh, okay. On that note, Bob, uh, we have one small step suggested to us at what school could be um, from Mark Lang saying if we could put together uh, a video or a paper that highlights some of the examples of the impact. So, you know, that's my my next step, my one small step to big change, uh, as we say. Uh, I, I would challenge everybody who's listening to this to take one small step to big change. Uh, engage with uh, what school could be, certainly engage with PBL Works because uh, there's a lot of amazing things there. We've shared the uh, website for PBL Works and you know uh, how to contact Bob. We'll also share uh, Bob's Twitter handle uh, so you guys can get con contact with Bob. Uh, certainly one small step doing one thing this year uh, is going to make a bigger difference in waiting for all the policy to uh, shift around us. 
Uh, on that, I want to share with you before we thank Bob, uh, what our next small steps are, or huge inspiring steps maybe uh, with our Game Changer conversations. I'd like to share with you uh, up next is Parul Punjabi uh, Jagdish, who will be uh, with us live. Uh, Josh Rapun, who's on here uh, in the chat, and I will be having a conversation with Parul live on October 20th, 7 p.m. Eastern from Schools of the Future conference in Hawaii. If you uh, haven't registered and you're in Hawaii and you can get to Schools of the Future and leading Schools of the Future, you can get more information on our website. Um, I'll also let you know our series coming up. Uh, we got this whole fall season packed with some amazing stuff. We have a, a diversity, equity, inclusion conversation coming up in early November, followed by an elementary focused conversation with um, uh, Ron Berger and uh, Dr. Robert Peters, um, followed by an amazing trio uh, of uh, influential educators in December. I really hope you guys can join us uh, for all of those game changers. So on that, uh, I will... See, first... I'm even more humbled now seeing that list that you have up there. That's amazing. Uh, well, uh, it, it's it, we're, we're grateful to be here. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ted to say a final thanks in a second. But from what school could be, Bob, I'll thank you. I'll thank everybody uh, who is here. Uh, Ted, final words, and then we'll see everybody else soon. Well, no, thanks as well to this community. The, the chat flow was really an energizing, great questions, great comments. And I think we really need to just be linking arms because, you know, these kids count on adults to make good decisions on their behalf. And honestly, for the most part, we don't. And, and I think this community and Bob's leadership, uh, and I love, uh, I love Mark's suggestion. We're going to do a great video that highlights your work. Uh, but I think we really need to be fighting as hard as possible on behalf of the kids that trust us. So thanks to everybody and uh, look forward to see. I'm going to be at the School of the Future conference as well. So I'm out there. If you're in Hawaii, track me down. Oh, I'm going to miss you guys. Have a great. I love that conference. It's going to be great. All right. Awesome. Thanks, thanks Bob. guys. Thanks for everybody who's watching. We'll see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Right.